is a comfort to my soul. Your word is the truth that sets me free. Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk, as we continue on in our study of the letter of James. Hooray. Hooray. Amen. Hooray. Um, this is quite a powerful letter, and I think I, I think oftentimes it's it's kind of left off to the side. But it won't be left off to the side today, I promise you. So we're going to start. We're in chapter four. We we're starting chapter four today, and we're going to do that right after Alice asks God's blessing on our time together. Praise God! I shall do that. Hallelujah, Father. We just bless you. We praise you. We thank you. We just rejoice in you, Lord. We rejoice in your word and that we have the opportunity to share it with so many through the technology that's Amen. available today, especially in these days. And Lord, we just ask that you would anoint us to really hear and speak what you say. Amen. Amen. All right. So we're going to be starting, as I said, in James chapter 4, verse 1. All right. Right. So let me start right off, and I'm reading from the New American Standard. By and large, that's that's what I use: New American Standard, the King James, and at times the English Standard Version. All right. All right. What is the source of your quarrels? Of, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? You know, many people have said to me as we've traveled, and we've traveled quite a bit, preaching and teaching the Word over the years. And they say that they they intend they attend a New Testament church. Yes. Have you ever heard of that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I attend a New Testament church. Yeah. And I always ask them which one? <laughs> right. Corinth, sinfully immature, divided, immoral, and full of people of full who are full of pride. More adept at bringing the world into the church than bringing the word to the world. Is that the is that the New Testament church you're a part of? Or I may ask them if perhaps they're part of the Church of the Galatians. Foolish believers who had come to believe that their works were more important than the work of Christ that he did on the cross. Yeah. That New Testament church? Or perhaps the Church of the Colossians, who were defrauded by the false wisdom of self-made religion, not understanding the things that actually please the Lord. Should I, should I mention the late Dicea? <laughs> That's the one I think we're in now. That's a, I do believe that. That's a New Testament church that literally made the Lord sick to his stomach. So the, the point of that is that James is here rebuking the believers that he's writing to in order to teach, to reprove, to correct, and to train them in righteousness. That's what Paul said the word is good for in Absolutely. 2 Timothy 3. Yeah. Yes. So Jesus said in the Gospel of Luke, that from everyone who has been given much, much will be required. Okay, that's Luke 12, 48. Think for a moment of the cross and think just how much we have been given. Mm. So is the church today focused on what we are given more than what's required? I'm not talking about legalism. I'm talking about love. I mean, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Amen. Okay, so no, I'm not talking about legalism, but the fact of the matter is that we should be keeping, adhering to, living by the word, which was given to us for our instruction. Whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, right? So here, it's not a question from James of if there are quarrels and uh, conflicts among the saved. It's a truth that he is dealing with. Mm -hmm. And it still needs dealing with today. It continued on. Well, do you believe there are any conflicts or any strife? Is there any in the church today? Whoa. There, there probably is more today simply because there are more churches, quote unquote. And by churches, I mean denominations, people who have set themselves off according to their thinking, right? And the communications today is much faster and it is. speedier than it was back then. For better or for worse, yeah. So it was division back then that caused the problem, and it's division now that causes the problem. And you can certainly see that in the world, mm -hmm. okay? 
I mean, my goodness, here in the United States of America, as we're recording this, during the midst of the, the COVID-19 thing, I mean, there are literally riots on the streets it's in major cities. It's, it's terrible. It's all about division, yes. right? Yes. So let me ask you a question. How many Christian denominations do you think there are? Way too many. I don't think you can count that high. I, and I'm, I'm not being facetious. No. There are certainly. So let's define that word, first of all, denomination. Mm -hmm. A religious denomination is a subgroup within a religion that operates under a common name, tradition, and identity. That's what Wikipedia says, all right? Okay. That's, that's a good technical definition of it. A subgroup operates under a common name. There is indeed a common name that we should be working under. It's, it's, a, it's a common name that the Word has given us. Name above all names. The name of all, Acts chapter 4, verse 12 says this, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. There's only one name. Absolutely. And I, I don't know if you know this, if you can go look it up in your Bible, it's not Baptist, okay. it's not Presbyterian, certainly not Roman Catholic. Not no, Christophel. no. Mm -hmm. See, whether you like it or not, let me read to you from Galatians 3, 26 to 28, first of all. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were, were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So, yes. how, so how do we wind up with all this division? It's evil. Because our division hides Jesus Christ from the world. Yes, it does. And in the church, by the way. It hides Jesus in the world and it hides Jesus in the church. We need to repent of our denominations. That's a fact. Listen. If you don't like that statement, I want to suggest that you get on your computer right now and write an email, send it to uh, Jesus at heaven.com and see what he has to say to you. Just get in your prayer closet. Have a talk with Jesus. Have a little talk with Jesus. That's right. First Corinthians 3, verses 3 to 3 and 4 says this. For you are all still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? And are you not walking like mere men? For when one says, I'm a Paul, and another, I'm of Apollos, are you not mere men? You know, that struck me the first time I read it, I think, and I said, okay, we're not mere men. What are we supposed to be? Superman! <laughs> well, you know, that may sound silly, but the fact of the matter is we are more than mere men because we are filled with the power of God right inside of us. He has chosen us to be his dwelling place. We are not mere men. We have power that the world doesn't have. We have power that the world doesn't understand. We have power that the world doesn't know about. And it's called the Holy Spirit of God. All right? And, we, and the church isn't really allowing that power to be manifested. Well, the, the problem is, if, if we have we allow this division, That's it's right. not going to work. They're quenching the Holy Spirit, then, aren't they? Well, it, of course. The, the thing is, God intended us as a body to be united, to work together. Yes. If you take part of it away, you reduce the power that it has. Right. You, you reduce the possibilities that exist. Right? So let me just take go back now to, to James a minute, which is so consistent with the Apostle Paul. So put aside anything you've heard of about there being conflict between Paul and James. In verse four, chapter 4, four verse 2, he said, You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. Well, I don't know if people in the pews are committing murder, killing somebody to get something that they, but the fact of the matter is maybe that's because we're not looking at things spiritually as we are called to. 
because Jesus spoke of the command in, in, in the law of you shall not commit murder. Right. And he said that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you know, you're good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says you fool shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Matthew 5, 22. In other words, what Jesus is saying, you don't understand murder. No. Because it's about bringing death, spiritual death. And the fact is that if you are not obeying the command of God, you're killing people. Serious. You're, 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 you're shooting bullets all over the place. Hmm. Right? So anyhow, he said, you're lust and do not have. you got to understand what lust is. Lust is an overcoming desire for something or someone. I mean, you can lust that for things. You can lust that for people. Now, let's look at lust versus these three verses. Verses, 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 verses. <laughs> Paul wrote in Philippians, Philippians 4.11 and said, Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. Contentment is the opposite of lust. Lust means you, you, you're miserable because you don't have something that you want. Contentment means you have everything you want. Okay. Paul wrote to Timothy, 1 Timothy 6. I'm going to read verses 5 and 6. And he said, Constant friction between men of depraved mind and deprived of the truth who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. But godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. God wants you to be content. Now, if you don't believe that, listen to these other verses. For we have brought nothing into the world. So we cannot take anything out of it either. Remember Job said, I, naked I came into the world, naked I'm going out. If we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. 1 Timothy 6, verses 7 and 8. Are you content? Or you have this, you know, you may not want to call it lust. But if you have this passionate desire for things in your heart, maybe you better re-examine what lust means in you to you. That's why in Hebrews, it says, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's Hebrews 13, 5. Now, remember what Paul said in the first of those verses I just read. He said, I have learned to be content. You don't come into the world content. No. I mean, let's go to a maternity ward and watch this happen. See the how many content babies well, they have. They come out hollering and screaming. That's right. Is that not? Yeah. They're only content once they have their milk. Well, and that's why it says in Peter that we're long for the word like a pure milk, a baby right. longs for pure milk. That's right. But you see, because it's a natural state of man, starting from childhood, to want what you don't have and to scream to get it, mm -hmm. one way or another, right? So if Paul, that amazing man of God, had to learn to be content, what makes you think that you ha don't have to learn to be content? You do have to learn. It's a learning process to know how to find contentment in your life. I'm just going to throw a verse in here because I, I, I enjoy it a lot. I enjoy lots of verses a lot. <laughs> Jesus said, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they shall be satisfied. Right. You know what that means? They'll be content. When you hunger and thirst for righteousness, you'll be satisfied. Why? Because you'll seek the Lord. And those who are uh, seeking the Lord, they shall, whatever they're looking for, they'll be answered, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's what it says in the Sermon on the Mount. That's what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All the rest shall be added unto you. If you want to find contentment, if you want to have that peace, seek the Lord. Because he is peace. So, but like I'm saying, you have to learn to do this. It doesn't come naturally. Yeah. It comes supernaturally. And it comes by practice. Well, it has to be learned. Yes. Hello, Holy Spirit. <laughs> Teach us self-denial. 
I mean, didn't that Jesus? Jesus summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Mark 8, 34. We're living in a time when people don't want to be denied anything. No. And that's as, that's as true in a church, unfortunately, as it seems to be in the world. They want what they want, and they're, you know, they're going to scream and cry until they get it. Contentment is certainly not a, a popular topic in the world, and all too rarely is it preached in the church. James said, you do not have because you do not ask. We are supposed to ask, by the way. Yes. Okay? I mean, Jesus made that clear. Right? Well, Paul, let me go to Paul. Paul again, to the church of the Philippians. He said, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Philippians 4, 6. We have to, we have to know that the font of the good things, the place of getting the good things, is not in your favorite store. It's at the feet of Jesus Christ. I mean, you know, Paul said in that same chapter in Philippians chapter 4, his promises, my God shall supply all of your needs through his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. You want to you want to receive something that you need? Go to the Lord in prayer. The question becomes, do you need it? What, we, what we perceive as a need is not necessarily so. Not necessarily. Usually not so. I mean, because we have been trained by the world. And by the way, you have been so trained by the world. I, had, I was so trained by the world. I was in the advertising business before I got saved. What do you think an advertising business does? It has one purpose and one purpose on, and it would be nice to say, well, they just want you to be aware of what's available. They don't, they don't want you to be aware, and they don't make money by making you aware. They want you to be discontent. They want you to be unhappy with what you have, so you will buy what they, they have to sell you. And I, they spend a lot of time and money on it. Every major advertising agency that I have dealt with in New York City has behavioral psychologists on staff to figure out how to get into your head mm -hmm. and change the way you think about something. How can they get you to desire this product, this thing so much that you'll dash right out and get it? You know, it's interesting because talking about need, I find myself saying this so many times. Well, I need, I need, I need. And you're always saying, you really need that? <laughs> We're quite a team. <laughs> we, we keep check. But it's true because in our natural state, we have just been trained to we if we see something we like, well, we want it. Oh no, no, we don't just want it; we need it. Yeah, yeah, we need it. And then it becomes, you know, I, I've talked this about this a lot, and I'm not going to talk about it right now too much. Anyhow, that there is a process of lust. Oh yes, it starts with looking at something. And that's what the advertising business gets you to do: yeah. look at it, then to like it. Yeah. And that's why advertising agencies make money by making it attractive. Absolutely. And when you like it, you let your mind linger on it. You start to think about it. Mm, that's and the danger. That's the danger place. That's when the arrow starts to go. No. Yes. I mean, there's nothing wrong with looking at something and liking it. I mean, there's a lot of nice stuff out there. But you have to be careful. You don't let your mind linger on it. Because when you let your mind linger on it, that will turn into lust. Yes. And then all of a sudden... It becomes a need, a perceived need in your life. Right. And it's not a need in your life, more than likely, right? So, as I say, James said, if you ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. So you spend it on your pleasures. Now, is there anything wrong with pleasure? No. It's only wrong depending on what you're looking for. I promise you, God will please you. God, God, it, to have that right relationship with God will be the most pleasing thing that you've ever experienced in life. And that's just a simple truth. Absolutely. But James is saying, ask and don't receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. Think about the wrong motives mm -hmm. and your pleasures. Is your life all about your desires? You're in the wrong place. If your life is all about your desires, I don't know, uh, uh, please. 
don't become a Buddhist. <laughs> don't, don't go join some wacko cult. The fact of the matter is, though, you're not going to find what you, you'll never find what you want. Because as it says in Proverbs, the leech has two daughters, give, give. You'll never be satisfied. But those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they shall be satisfied, all right? So if we're going to look and study this, and we are, I mean, think about this. If your life is all about your desires, you're in the wrong place. Christianity is not it's in. About desires. It's not. Look at the Lord's Prayer. Now, I am not talking about the Our Father of Sunday schools. I'm talking about what Jesus prayed. In Luke 22, 42, Jesus prayed saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Mm. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. That's the Lord's prayer, and that should become our prayer. Not my will, but thy will be done. While the Word says, and the Word does say this, delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. That's Psalm 37, 4. The truth of the matter is that if we delight ourselves in the Lord, He will become the desire of our heart. That's the truth. And you know what? That doesn't take an advertising agency to promote Him. Because when you see Jesus Christ as he is, the more clearly and closely you see Jesus and walk with Jesus, the more you will know the truth about what is good in your life, what satisfies in your life, what you need actually need in your life. I just want to say, because so many people are, you know, what's attractive is riches. So think about this, what God said to Job, right? I'm going to read Job 22 verses 23 to 26. Listen to this now. If you return to the Almighty, you will be restored. If you remove unrighteousness far from your tent and place your gold in the dust and the gold of Ophir among the stones of the brooks, then the Almighty will be your gold and choice silver to you. For then you will delight in the Almighty and lift up your face to God. You think silver and gold is going to satisfy you? It will not. But I'm telling you that what Jesus is saying, what God is saying here, throw you, throw you, throw you a desire for that away, and He'll become your choice gold and choice silver to you. He becomes the desire of your heart, and then you will delight in the Almighty. Mm -hmm. What will it take for us to be able to say, as Asaph did in Psalms, in the Psalms? Think about this. Because I, I want, it's my great desire to have this on the tip of my tongue, coming from the depth of my heart. Whom have I in heaven but you? And beside you, I desire nothing on earth. Psalm 73, 25. Can that come to be our confession? Besides our relationship with the Lord, I desire nothing on earth. All right, let's see. I'm going to move along here to keep up here. In, in chapter 4, verse 4, James says, You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. An enemy of God. Don't forget that John wrote, John the Apostle wrote in, in his first letter, uh, 1 John 2.15, do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So James has taken it a step further. Not just about loving the world, now it's about friendship with the world. Right. Radical, that's the word I'm looking for. And you know what, we need to be radical. Because remember, James had just written in this letter before this, and he said, and the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. James 2.23. Abraham was a friend of God. You know, I flew in the Navy, and on the, in the Navy, I flew patrols in the North Atlantic around Russia, and we had a thing, it's called IFF, IFF Identification Friend or Foe. I mean, I don't know what the technology is today, probably much, much different, much more sophisticated. Yeah. But the thing was, we could look and see, look at a, an aircraft out there, because commercial aircraft were required to carry this IFF. Mm -hmm. 
So we could look at a plane and tell what it was, whether it was a friend or whether it was a foe. Can people look at you and tell whether you're a friend of God or a foe of God? It's digital. It's one or the other. It is. So much. So much in us. So it said in that verse, Abraham believed God. Now that's faith. Mm -hmm. Right? James also wrote in that second chapter, So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. James 2, 17 and 18. A friend of God has to give evidence of that fact by his or her life. New life that we've been given requires a new lifestyle. Jesus said, you shall know them by their fruit, right? In Matthew 7. Yes. God searches our heart. Men can't do that. No. They can only see the outward appearance what our life looks like. So that's why it says in Titus, I'm going to read Titus 2, 7 and 8, and I, I think maybe this is where we're going to have to close. In all things, show yourself to be an example of good deeds, with purity in doctrine, dignified, sound in speech, which is beyond reproach, so that the opponent will be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. Are we at a place where people can't mock God because of our behavior? I'm going to tell you, it's, it's definitely unfortunate and shameful that I see so much where people are mocking God because of activity in the church that is ungodly behavior. Well, James is a very serious guy, and this is a very serious letter. And this is a letter about reproof. This is about rebuke. This is about training in righteousness. This is... This is what we need to hear. This is about Be repenting. Because this is what we need to live. That's right. So, Father, we, we thank you, Lord God, that you whatever was written was written for our instruction, that you have provided us with this for our instruction, Lord God, that we would be living more and more in a way that brings glory to you. So we praise you and thank you that you can use us in all of our humanity, in all of our feeble humanity. Lord, that because of the power of your Holy Spirit that you have put within us, that you can be glorified by our lives. We know that all things, you cause all things to work together for good for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. So, Lord, we don't want to look for our good in what's going on. We want to look for your glory in what's going on in our lives. So we praise you and thank you for that, Lord. We praise you and thank you for James who came before us, for Peter who came before us, for Paul who came before us for all of the saints, all of the brothers and sisters who faithfully walked according to your word. Help us to join that number in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, until next week, be back with us again. And if you have any questions, write to us at office at BibleTalk.com. We'd love to hear from you. God bless you and goodbye. Remember, Jesus loves you. A lot. A very lot. A very lot. Bye-bye. Thank you.